Hello everyone, it's Jay, and yes, I am by myself right now, as I'm sure many of you are, I am sitting actually in my office, I'm, I'm still able to go into work, and I'm still at my office, although I'm completely by myself, as I am the only one who is currently uh, still coming into the office. The rest of my coworkers have been sent home and are working from home, as I'm sure many of you listening are, and you probably noticed that I did not have a new episode of the podcast yesterday, which it was due, and that is due to the same reason I'm actually sitting alone in my office right now. So, I mean, I can't really say more about coronavirus than you already know because you're all living it too. Uh, we did not get out last weekend to do our cross-country skiing episode. There was just a lot going on and even though we hadn't you know Minnesota wasn't out of school yet our employer hadn't sent us all home yet but we knew it was coming and there was a lot of things that we just decided we needed to take care of rather than going out and recording the episode so yeah you're not getting your last episode we're also not going to be able to bring you right now the bucket list episode we had planned because I haven't seen Martha in a few days, although I'm hoping very soon I will be able to see her and we will be able to record the bucket list episode and that will be coming out next week. In the meantime, I kind of wanted to bring you some more episodes of the podcast, kind of a nice way to maybe get away. I don't know. I know a lot of people are saying that they're listening to their podcasts still and they're getting disappointed when they aren't releasing new episodes because it's a good way to escape. So I figured I would come back and bring you some more history episodes because this is something I can do by myself in my office. It probably won't be as much fun as if I'm going back and forth with, you know, Martha or Joe or one of our other um, guest co-hosts. So I do apologize because it's just me talking right now. Again, I'm hoping we hear and see from Martha very, very, very soon. But in the meantime, um, you're going to get some history from me. And we're going to start off today with a history episode of a North Shore town that we've visited in the podcast. I've referenced it many times, and that is the town of Silver Bay. And I wanted to do this one because I'm from Silver Bay. That's my town. That's where I grew up. So I, I love Silver Bay. It, it has its flaws. <laughs> You'll hear about that in just a minute. But I love the town. I love my neighbors. I love my friends growing up. So I wanted to bring you a little bit of history of Silver Bay, probably one of the most passed over towns on the North Shore, simply because you actually have to turn off Highway 61 to go through it. Every other town you kind of, you know, two harbors you drive through, Beaver Bay, you drive right through town, even Schroeder and to an extent, you know, Tofty and Lutzen, although most of Lutzen is the mountain and you have to turn in to get there, but the town of Lutzen you still drive through. And same thing with Graham Ray. So all the towns, you drive through them. So you see the businesses, you can pull in and stop. You might not even realize Silver Bay is there if you're just driving past. You see this huge plant on the lakeside of the road, but you don't see the houses and you don't see the businesses. So here's a little bit of history of a lesser known town on the North Shore. This podcast episode is sponsored by Cascade Vacation Rentals. They know that life has a tendency to be overwhelming at times and busy schedules often leave people feeling overwhelmed and disconnected. That's why they're here to offer you the space and opportunity to reconnect to what's important. Cascade Vacation Rentals has one of the largest selections of privately owned vacation rental homes and cabins on Minnesota's North Shore of Lake Superior, from Duluth to the Canadian border. Their team is there to help you and your family or small group enjoy a vacation you'll remember for years to come. Visit them online at www.cascadevacationrentals.com. And don't forget to use promo code PODCAST for the largest percent off discount available at any given time. Again, that's www.cascadevacationrentals.com. So most of this history was taken from the silverbay.com website. So if you go to silverbay.com and click about, there's a little history section. And so that's where I got most of this information from. So in 1945, Reserve Mining Company through the Northern Land Company and Lake Spirit Land Company, which... By the way, another fascinating history story I will plan to bring you someday soon. 
uh, those two land companies. Anyway, they, they started acquiring, Reserve did, started acquiring the land northeast of Beaver Bay. The land was paid for in cash, and there was an attempt to keep the acquisition pretty secret. Supposedly, it was to not drive up land prices nearby, although I do have a suspicion, too, that they didn't want to make their plans known in case there was some local opposition to the building of a taconite plant, which is what eventually went there. The initial rumors were that a large resort was coming to the area, but in 1946, it became very clear that this was not a purchase that was going to be used as a resort because reserve mining started to flag out and build their processing plant. The reserve mining company obtained the necessary state and federal permits to begin construction on the taconite processing plant in 1947. However, the clearing of the land actually didn't begin until 1951, and then construction would virtually happen night and day as they just rushed to get this huge project built. It was finally completed in October of 1955. Now, houses in the town were originally limited. They were just kind of expecting like young single men to come up and work in the plant, and they weren't really expecting a lot of people with families. So initially, the houses were limited to just people working in senior positions in the plant. The company then built a barrack-style housing with dormitories and a cafeteria, and that's where most of the workers would live. Uh, this is actually now, I used to think that area was the old apartment buildings that if you pull into town and you drive up uh, banks, if you know Silver Bay at all, and you know, there's two main roads that kind of go up inland from town. So Outer Drive is where you come if you just turn at the lights and you drive straight up, you're on Outer Drive. But if you go a block inland, basically you're on banks. So at that point, if you were to take that road, you would see these kind of pastel greenish. It, they were really ugly. They're horrible. Like these metal pastel, gross colored <laughs> apartment buildings. I used to think that was them, but it turns out the dormitory housing is now where the office complex is located uh, back on Highway 61. Those apartments were built later, partially actually to house the teachers that they were bringing in. So I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're trying to visualize Silver Bay and visualize where this barrack style housing was. It was where the offices are, not those apartments. They also built a trailer court for those coming with families, which they quickly realized they couldn't just have these barrack styles because people were showing up with families and other people were coming to support the town as teachers and shop owners and things like that. So they realized quickly they needed more than just the apartments and the dormitories. They needed actual houses. So they started building the trailer court and then they also started building the houses. And it's kind of interesting if you drive through Silver Bay today, you can still tell the different phases of the houses being built. Uh, another interesting thing is that the streets in Silver Bay are alphabetized. So if you start at the bottom of town, closer to Highway 61, you're in the A's. And then there's another kind of cluster of streets that are the B's. And next to that, you have the C's and then further up the D's and then the E, F and G's. That's kind of the original part of town. If you want to take a drive around and see this for yourself, you'll notice that those houses are all basically the same layout. I think there were three that they were going with and they just sort of alternated them. You know, this is based on me being inside of several homes in the Silver Bay area growing up, uh, living in one. My parents now live in a different one that has a different layout than our first one. And just going into everybody's houses, they're all basically the same. They just sort of rotated them and then moved like where the kitchen and the living room are. That's it. Like everybody lived in the same house. It was very interesting. So anyway, uh, originally houses were very limited, though. Only the seniors had them, um, kind of the senior executives and managers and things like that. And during this time, the town was known as the Beaver Bay Housing Project. But then on May 1st, 1954, the town was officially named Silver Bay. And one of the first houses built in town actually became the post office. And then Silver Bay was issued its own mail canceling stamp, thus officially becoming a town. 1956 was another banner year for Silver Bay. The last of the six original pelletizing machines was fired up in February. And the first shipment of pellets went out on the C.L. Austin ship in April. In March of that year... 
Compton Elementary School was opened in order to alleviate the burden on Beaver Bay School, which was just this tiny two-room schoolhouse that was completely overflowing with kids at this point. Uh, Compton School would later close down and become the Veterans Home. So if you know where the Veterans Home is, that's where the original elementary school was. Then after the $350 million investment, the Reserve Mining Company plant was officially dedicated on September 3rd of 1956. Then in October 16th, Silver Bay voted to incorporate with a mayor or council form of government. So at that point, the plant is up and running. There's people, there's a school, there's shops opening up. The plant is fully up and running and they now have a mayor. Big year for Silver Bay. 1958 was another big year when William Kelly High School, which was named after Reserved Mining's first president, was opened. And before then, and if you listen to the Ghost Town episode of this, this kind of crosses into that a little bit. Before that time, Silver Bay students were bused 28 miles down to two harbors. Now, if you remember um, Mineral Center and Forest Center, those towns would actually bus their kids and they would dorm in Ely because that was closer. But when Silver Bay opened their school, then not only were the Silver Bay students able to go there, but these little tiny towns that had kind of popped up in the area, they were also able to send their kids to a closer school. So Silver Bay kids now had their own high school, their own elementary school. Things were looking pretty good. 1958 was also the year that Reserve Mining sold its downtown strip mall to private owners. So before then, the entire town was completely owned by the company. Company run, it was a company town in every single way you could think of. But at that point, new owners were coming in. Things were kind of expanding out past the plant. They were trying to really grow Silver Bay as a town. In fact, the Duluth News Tribune once stated that the Silver Bay Shopping Center was, and this is a quote here, expected to be the largest on the North Shore north of Duluth. So if you've been into Silver Bay, you know that this did not end up becoming true. And we'll kind of get into why. Silver Bay Strip Mall never became much more than like a six, seven, maybe eight, like store strip mall. So in the 1960s, that brought kind of the second wave of construction. So both the plant and the town saw huge growth in the 1960s. Reserve mining expanded production from 6 million to 10 million tons of taconite per year. And with that expansion came about 400 new jobs. So this brought more houses, more stores, and then they also opened up the Murray McDonald Elementary School to accommodate the growing number of kids. In 1964, Rocky Taconite, which of course we've had that episode not too long ago, the history of the statues of the North Shore, we told you all about Rocky. Well, he was installed and came to symbolize Silver Bay as the, quote, Taconite capital of the world. Things were going really, really good for Silver Bay at this point. The population soared to almost 3,000 people, if not at one point over 3,000. But that's kind of where things started to fall into trouble times. For years, reserve mining was coming under increased pressure to stop dumping its waste rocks, like the taconite tailings, into Lake Superior. On February 17th, 1972, the U.S. Justice Department filed a lawsuit against Reserve for violating the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, which prohibited the dumping of harmful materials into interstate waters. Exploring the North Shore is sponsored by The Big Lake. The Big Lake is an approachable art gallery and gift shop located in the beautiful harbor town of Grand Marais, Minnesota, as well as online at thebiglakelife.com. The Big Lake provides a beautifully curated and fun shopping experience to complement your North Shore adventures with artists and products that reflect the culture, values, allure, and lifestyle of the North Shore. Shop online at www.thebiglakelife.com and use promo code EXPLORE for 15% off your first online order. For five years, the trial just kind of dragged on, leaving everybody in Silver Bay wondering if they would continue to have their homes and their jobs or if their entire industry was going to be shut down. Finally, on July 7th, 1977, Reserve Mining was given permission to build a tailings storage basin seven miles inland from Silver Bay in an area now known as Mile Post 7, which is a 
bit of an urban legend, although it's actually real. It exists and it's it's there. So it's not really an urban legend, but there's a lot of stories around it that aren't true. But yes, so um, Mile Po 7 is a place. It's where they then dumped their waste tailings. Just two years later, when everything seemed to be getting back to normal in Silver Bay, there was a sudden decline in demand for steel. During this time, especially on the Iron Range, we saw a lot of the mills and the mines and plants starting to close, and this put thousands of people out of work. Reserve mining was forced to cut production at the Silver Bay plant, and work first finally closed on July 31st, 1986, and the plant was idled. Completely shut down. So almost immediately after that, the population of Silver Bay dropped from 2,917, which was the number we have for the 1980 census, although it was probably a little bit higher in the 70s. But by the 1990 census, it was down to 1,894 people. It was likely much lower than that in the 1980s, although the actual number is not known since there was no census done in 85. For three years, Silver Bay just kind of sat around and they waited for something to happen. The plant just sat there kind of wasting away. People started moving out in mass numbers. Houses were basically abandoned. I remember a story once that somebody told me, actually, when I was living in Minneapolis and working down there, they're like, oh, we know Silver Bay. At some point, I think it was in 1980, uh, like the mid 80s. I don't remember the exact. I want to say it was like 1987. This family was just driving north and they happened to see Silver Bay and noticed for sale signs on every single house. And they're like, well, what's going on here? And they contacted the realtor. And the realtor was like, well, yeah, we, we can basically sell you any house you want for $10,000. But just know that if nothing happens in this town, your house is just going to fall apart. They're not going to have water or septic. You know, they're going to cut off electricity and the town will be... You look at Taconite Harbor. So t this had already happened or was actually happening at the time in Taconite Harbor where they're like, all right, guys, you're going to have to get out and the whole town ceased to exist. This particular family spent $40,000. They bought four houses, and he was telling me that that helped them really get a step up because just a few years later, they were able to turn around and sell them for much more than they bought them for because Silver Bay did not die. In 1989, in the spring, was purchased by Cypress Mining of Denver. They put $30 million worth of repairs and renovations into the plant before then selling it to Cleveland Cliffs of Ohio in 1994. This is actually where the SilverBay.com history ends, but uh, the, the history of Silver Bay doesn't end in 1994. In fact, there's a lot more to it. And this is when I was there. I was growing up. I was a kid in Silver Bay in fourth grade in 1994. So um, another thing that happened was while the plant opened back up, it did so kind of at a much smaller capacity than it had back when Reserve Mining owned it. The 2000 census only had the town at about 2,068 people, and then the 2010 census saw an even um, smaller population. It had dropped down to 1,887 people. Also in the 2000s, the Mary McDonald Elementary School closed. They kind of decided the building was getting to be too old. They didn't need that much space for the number of students they had. And rather than doing the major repairs needed to keep it functioning as an elementary school, they shut it down and turned it into uh, kind of another shopping center. So there's like a thrift store in there. There's a pharmacy in there. Uh, at this exact moment in time, there is a natural food store. It's not a store, but they, they make stuff there. But that might be changing very soon as well. But, you know, that's what it became. And at that point, the William Kelly High School became the William Kelly School and now accommodates preschools through 12th grade. So the town never fully recovered from its original kind of heyday in the 60s and early 70s. And then 2016 saw another wave of lost, lost jobs and worry for Silver Bay when the plant idled for six months. So, I, you know, this time I was living up in Grand Marais, and I remember it very clearly. People were really concerned again. My dad was the pharmacist in Silver Bay, the only pharmacist in Silver Bay for many, many... I mean, he, there, there's only one pharmacist in Silver Bay still. It's not my dad anymore because he re retired in July of 2019. But... He was even thinking, okay, I might lose my job. This town might not be able to support a pharmacist. 
and they started looking at other positions. So, I mean, this was kind of a big serious time for Silver Bay history. Luckily, they were able to reopen again after the six months. But even with the plant going, there's always kind of that looming threat, I think, at that point on the longevity of mining and whether or not it could happen again. Again, look at Taconite Harbor. That never recovered to the point where the town isn't there anymore. The plant's pretty much completely shut down, and everybody who used to work there is gone. They're somewhere else. Only time will tell at this point what Silver Bay will look like, you know, 10 years from now, five years from now even. They went from a small booming city to virtually a ghost town in just two years in the late 80s, and then, you know, came back to a point, although it's still not quite as much. There may be some light at the end of the tunnel for Silver Bay, however. Recent expansions of Black Beach, which is a, it's actually a a beach that was created from the tailings that Taconite, or that reserve mining used to dump into the Lake Superior. Don't worry, it's not toxic. It's a perfectly safe beach, but they opened it up to the public, and they're did a groundbreaking just last year in 2019 for the Black Beach Campground. So pretty soon, Silver Bay is going to start seeing a little more tourism, which they hadn't really had before. Last year also saw the creation and the opening of the North Shore Adventure Park right there along Highway 61, which we have covered in the podcast in the past. So as years go on, we may see more attempts. In fact, I hope we see more attempts from Silver Bay to make their little community, a little tourism destination. I don't think it'll get to the point that Grand Marais is at or, or at Lutzen Mountains is at with, you know, the ski hill and stuff, but they're trying, you know, Black Beach Campground, uh, North Shore Adventure Park. There are also, you know, restaurants in town. There's the uh, Northwoods Family Grill, Jamie's Pizza. They do have some stores. Our little local grocery store Zups um, is by itself this kind of hilarious attraction that i've found out people actually will pull into silver bay to go grocery shopping at zups just so they can say they've gone grocery shopping at zups Uh, but yeah so there's stuff going on for the town they're kind of getting to the point where they can stop relying on mining a little bit although i think they're always you know the, the the plant is always going to be the biggest employer in town And they're always going to be a little bit reliant on that. But I think now they're kind of setting the stones in place so that if it has to idle again for any period of time, they'll be fine. They'll be able to kind of reallocate what people are doing and where they're going. There's enough nature and history and other things in the area now that they can do that. Tedaguchi State Park is really close by. They have a really nice visitor center. It's pretty new, built just a few years ago. And so that's the sort of way that Silver Bay is really trying to capitalize not just on the iron ore aspect of their town, but also on the beautiful natural things that are there. So next time you're you're driving up the shore, take that left turn at those lights on Highway 61 and go check out Silver Bay. Again, it's really interesting just to drive around the town and kind of see where, okay, this is where the stuff was built in the 1950s. Those ugly apartment buildings were torn down and replaced with a, um, I think it's a assisted care facility now. And you can just drive around town and kind of see this evolution and see we're in the 80s. They built some more houses just before they shut down. And then after they picked back up in the 90s, they started building more houses. And then an entire neighborhood was kind of plopped into the, you know, northern part of town in the 2000s you can see all this and it's really fascinating to drive around and see so next time swing in check it out maybe spend the night you know american inn is there there's a few vacation rentals in the area cove point and beaver bay you know there's just options now so that is the history today of silver bay So thank you for tuning in, and I'm hoping to bring you a lot more of history and maybe some, you know, news and updates. Of course, we're all in the same boat with this coronavirus shutdown. We're all just kind of sitting at home looking for something to do. So I'm hoping I can bring you a few more episodes in the next couple of weeks and keep you at least a little bit entertained and thinking about the North Shore, even if you can't come up to the North Shore right now. And then when you're able to again... We hope we see you back up here again very soon. We miss all of you. It's very, very strange being up here without 
people from other places coming to visit. It's always been really fun to run into people at stores and when you're out and about and learn where they're from and why they came here. And it's really sad that I can't do that right now. I didn't realize how big of a part of my life that was until it was gone, even for this very short period of time. Because really, I'm recording this on March 18th. I plan to release it on March 18th. So this is me talking today about that. Um, so yeah, everybody, you know, stay home, wash your hands, stay healthy, and I'll be back again very soon.